and I'm going to share with RFK's channel on Rumble. RFK to address the nation. Is this it? Hello, everyone. Welcome so much for being here. Um, I'd like to introduce everyone to Robert or bring on Robert F. Kennedy Jr. Okay, so we, we all see this. Everybody hears this. We're on people. I'm sorry to keep everybody waiting. 16 months ago in April of 2023, I launched my campaign for president of the United States. I began this journey as a Democrat, the party of my father, my uncle, the party which I pledged my own allegiance to long before I was old enough to vote. Is the audio good? I attended my first Democratic convention at the age of six in 1960. And back then, the Democrats were the champions of the Constitution. This is good. Of civil rights. The Democrats stood against authoritarianism, against censorship, against colonialism, imperialism, and unjust wars. We were the party of labor, of the working class. The Democrats were the party of government transparency and the champion of the environment. Our party was the bulwark against big money interests mm -hmm. and corporate power. How much has changed? True to its name, it was the party of democracy. As you know, I left that party in October because it had departed so dramatically from the core values that I grew up with. It had become the party of war, censorship, corruption, big pharma, big tech, big ag, and big money. When it abandoned democracy by canceling the primary to conceal mm -hmm. the cognitive decline of the sitting president, I left the party to run as an independent. The mainstream of American politics and journalism derided my decision. Mm -hmm. Conventional wisdom said that it would be impossible even to get on the ballot as an independent because each state poses an insurmountable tangle of arbitrary rules for collecting signatures. Barnes has been talking I about this over forever. a million signatures, something no presidential candidate in history had ever achieved. And then I would need a team of attorneys and millions of dollars to handle all the legal challenges from the DNC. The, nader, the naysayers told us that we were climbing a glass version of Mount Impossible. So the first thing I want to tell you is that we proved them wrong. We did it because beneath the radar of mainstream media organs, we inspired a massive independent political movement. Mm -hmm. More than 100,000 volunteers sprang into action, hopeful that they could reverse our nation's decline. Many worked 10-hour days, sometimes in blizzards and blazing heat. They sacrificed family time, personal commitments and sleep month after month, energized by a shared vision of a nation healed of its divisions. They set up tables at churches and farmers markets. They canvassed door to door. In Utah and in New Hampshire, volunteers collected signatures in snowstorms. And Democrats screwed me. each supporter to stop in the frigid cold, take off their gloves and to sign legibly. During a heat wave in Nevada, I met a tall athletic volunteer who cheerfully told me that he had lost 25 pounds collecting signatures in 117 degree heat. To finance this effort, young Americans donated their lunch money and senior citizens gave up their part of their social security checks. Our 50 state organization collected those millions of signatures and more. No presidential campaign in his political, American political history has ever done that. And so I want to thank all of those dedicated volunteers and congratulate the campaign staff. But who coordinated this enormous logistical feat. Your accomplishments were regarded as impossible. You carried me up that glass mountain. You pulled off a miracle. You achieved what all the pundits said could never be done. You have my deepest gratitude, and I'm never going to forget that, not just for what you did for my campaign, but for the sacrifices you made because you love our country. 
you show to everyone that democracy is still possible here. Mm -hmm. It continues to survive in the press and in the idealistic human energies that still thrive beneath the canvas of neglect and of official and institutional corruption. Today, I'm here to tell you that I will not let, allow your efforts to go to waste. I'm here well, to tell only you one that way I to do that. leverage your tremendous accomplishments to serve the ideals that we share, the ideals of peace, of prosperity, Trump, of Trump, freedom, Trump, of health, all the ideals that motivated my campaign. I'm here today to describe the path forward that you have opened with your commitment and with your hard labors. Now, <clears throat> in an honest system, I believe that I would have won the election. In a system that my kind that my father and my uncles thrived in, a system with open debates, with fair primaries, with regularly scheduled debates, with fair primaries, and with a truly independent media untainted by government propaganda and censorship. In a system of nonpartisan courts and election boards, everything would be different. After all, the polls consistently showed me beating each of the other candidates, both in favorability and also in head-to-head -head matchups. And I'm sorry to say that while democracy may still be alive at the grassroots, mm -hmm. it's it has a become top. little more than a slogan for our political institutions, for our media, and for our government, and most sadly at all for me, the Democratic Party. In the name of saving democracy, the Democratic Party set itself to dismantling it, mm -hmm. lacking confidence in its candidate that, that its candidate could win in a fair election yeah, at the voting booth take him out the dnc waged continual legal warfare against both president trump and myself each time that our volunteers turned in those towering he's, boxes he's joining signatures Trump. needed to get on the ballot the dnc dragged us into court state after state attempting to erase their work and to subvert the will of the voters mm -hmm. who had signed those petitions. This is massive. It deployed DNC-aligned judges to throw me and other candidates off the ballot and to throw President Trump in jail. Yep. It ran a sham primary that was rigged to prevent any serious challenge to President Biden. Mm -hmm. Then when a predictably bungled debate performance precipitated the palace coup against President Biden. The palace coup. The same shadowy DNC operatives appointed his successor, also without an election. This is the biggest they condemnation the candidate of the Democrats was ever. was so unpopular with voters that she dropped out in 2020 without winning a single delegate. My uncle and my father both relished debate. They prided themselves on their capacity to go toe to toe with any opponent and the battle over ideas. They would be astonished to learn of a Democratic Party presidential nominee who, like Vice President Harris, has not appeared in a single interview or an unscripted encounter with voters for 35 days. This is profoundly undemocratic. How are people to choose when they don't know whom they are choosing mm -hmm. and how can this look to the rest of the world? Like a kangaroo republic. My father republic. and my uncle were always conscious of America's image abroad because of our nation's role as the template for democracy, the role model for democratic processes, and the leader of the free world. Instead of showing us her substance and character, She's the hiding. DNC and its media organs engineered a surge of popularity for Vice President Harris oh based goodness. upon... Uh oh, nothing. No <laughs> policies. Based upon no interviews. Nothing. No debates. Only smoke and mirrors and balloons in a highly produced Chicago circus. There in Chicago, a string of Democratic speakers mentioned Donald Trump 147 times just on the first day. Oh, who needs a policy when you have Trump to hate? In contrast, at the RNC convention, President Biden was mentioned only twice in four days. I do interviews every day. 
many of you have interviewed me. Anybody who asks gets to interview me. Some days I do as many as 10. President Trump, who actually was nominated and won an election, mm -hmm. also does interviews daily. How did the Democratic Party choose a candidate that has never done an interview or debate during the entire election cycle? They're not Democrats. They know the answers. They did it by weaponizing the government agencies. They did it by abandoning democracy. They did it by suing the opposition and by disenfranchising American voters. What most alarms me isn't how the Democratic Party conducts its internal affairs or runs its candidates. What alarms me is the resort to censorship mm -hmm. and media control. And lawfare. And the weaponization of the federal agencies. Mm -hmm. When a U.S. president colludes with or outright coerces media companies to censor political speech, it's an attack on our most sacred right of free expression. And that's the very right upon which all of our other constitutional rights rest. President Biden mocked Vladimir Putin's 88% landslide <laughs> in the Russian elections, yeah. observing that Putin and his party controlled the Russian press. Yeah, and Kamala got 99. And Putin prevented serious opponents from appearing on the ballot. Mm -hmm. But here in America, the DNC also prevented opponents from appearing on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And our television networks expose themselves as Democratic Party organs. Over the course of more than a year in a campaign where my poll numbers reached at times 10 percent high 20s, the DNC allied mainstream media networks maintain a near perfect embargo on interviews with me. Yep. During his 10 month presidential campaign in 1992, Ross Perot gave 34 interviews on mainstream networks. In contrast, during the 16 months since I declared, ABC, NBC, CBS, MSNBC, and CNN combined gave only two live interviews from me. Those networks instead ran a continuous deluge of hit pieces with inaccurate, often vile, pejoratives and defamatory smears. Some of those same networks and colluded with the DNC to keep me off the debate stage. No crap. Representatives of those networks are in this room right now. And I'll just take a moment to ask you to consider the many ways that your institutions have abdicated this really sacred responsibility, the duty of a free press to safeguard democracy and to challenge always the party in power. Instead of maintaining that posture of fierce skepticism toward authority, your institutions have made, your, made themselves government mouthpieces and stenographers for the organs of power. You didn't alone cause the devolution of American democracy, but you could have prevented it. The Democratic Party's censorship of social media was even more of a naked exercise of executive power. This week, a federal judge, Terry Doty, upheld my injunction against mm -hmm. President Biden, calling the White House's censorship project, quote, the most egregious violation of the First Amendment in the history of the United States of America. Doty's previous 155-page decision details how just 37 hours after he took the oath of office, swearing to uphold the Constitution, President Biden and his White House opened up a portal and then invited the CIA, the FBI, CISA, which is a censorship agency, it's, it's the center of the censorship industrial complex, DHS, the IRS, and other agencies to censor me and other political dissidents on social media. Oh my goodness. Even today, users who try to post my campaign videos to Facebook or YouTube and messages that this content violates community standards. Two days after Judge Odie rendered his decision this week, Facebook was still attaching warning labels to an online petition calling on ABC to include me in the upcoming debate. They said that violates community standards, their community standards. Um, 
the mainstream media was once the guardian of the First Amendment and democratic principles, and has joined this systemic attack on democracy. It also, the media justifies their censorship on the grounds of combating misinformation, uh, but governments and, and oppressors don't censor lies. They don't fear lies. They fear the truth, and that's what they censor. And I, and I don't want any of this to sound like a personal complaint because it's not. I, um, for me, uh, it, it, it's all part of a journey and it's a journey that I signed up with. But I need to make these observations because I think they're critical for us doing the thing that we need to do as citizens in a democracy to assess where we are in this country and what our democracy still looks like and the assumptions about U.S. leadership around the globe. This is amazing. And are, are we living, up, are we really still a role model for democracy in this country? No, a laughing stock of the international or community. Have we made it you know, a kind of a, a joke? Here's the good news. While mainstream outlets denied me a critical platform, they didn't shut down my ideas, which have especially flourished among young voters and independent voters thanks to the alternative media. Many months ago, I promised the American people that I would withdraw from the race if I became a spoiler. A spoiler is someone who will alter the outcome of the election but has no chance of winning. Mm -hmm. In my heart, I no longer believe that I have a realistic path to electoral victory in the face of this relentless systematic censorship. They're, they're out of money. And media control. So I cannot in good conscience ask my staff and volunteers to keep working their long hours or ask my donors to keep giving when I cannot honestly tell them that I have a real path to the White House. Furthermore, our polling consistently showed that by staying on the ballot in the battleground states, I would likely hand the election over to the Democrats with whom I disagree yeah, on the to, most existential issues. To put it mildly. Censorship, war, and chronic disease. Oh, I want everyone to know that I am not terminating my campaign. I am simply suspending it and not not ending it. My name <clears throat> my name will remain on the ballot in most states. I think he's crying. If you live in a blue state, you can vote for me without harming or helping President Trump or or, or Vice President Harris. In red states, the same will apply. I encourage you to vote for me. And if enough of you do vote for me, and neither of the major party candidates win 270 votes, which is quite possible. In fact, today our polling shows them tying at 269 to 269. And I could conceivably still end up in the White House in a contingent election. But yeah, no. uh, in about 10 battleground states, where my presence would be a spoiler, I'm going to remove my name. And I've already started that process and urge voters not to vote for me. It's with a sense of victory and not defeat that I'm suspending my campaign activities. Not only did we do the impossible by collecting a million signatures, we changed the national political conversation forever. Chronic disease, free speech, government corruption, breaking our addiction to war, have moved to the center of politics. I can say to all who have worked so hard the last year and a half, thank you for a job well done. Three great causes drove me to enter this race in the first place, primarily. And these are the principal causes that persuaded me to leave the Democratic, Democratic Party and and run as an independent, and now to throw my support to President Trump, the, the causes were free speech, Clip it. a war in Ukraine, and the war on our children. <clears throat> I've already described some of my personal experiences and struggles with the government's censorship industrial complex. I want to say a word about the Ukraine war. The military industrial complex has provided us with a familiar 
comic book justification like they do on every war, that this one is a noble effort to stop a supervillain, Vladimir Putin, from invading the Ukraine and then to thwart his Hitler-like march across Europe. In fact, tiny Ukraine is a proxy in a geopolitical struggle mm -hmm. <clears throat> initiated by the ambitions of the U.S. neocons for American global hegemony. I'm not excusing Putin for invading Ukraine. He had other options. But the, Russia is war, the, the war is Russia's predictable response to the reckless neocon project of extending NATO to encircle Russia, a hostile act. The credulous media rarely explain to Americans that we unilaterally walked away from two intermediate nuclear weapons treaties with Russia and then put nuclear ready Aegis missile systems in Romania and Poland. This is a hostile, hostile act. And, the white, the, uh, and that the Biden White House repeatedly spurned Russia's offer to settle this war peacefully. The Ukraine war began in 2014 when U.S. agencies overthrew the democratically elected government of Ukraine and installed a hand-picked pro-Western government that launched a deadly civil war against ethnic Russians in Ukraine. In 2019, America walked away from a peace treaty, the Minsk Agreement, that had been negotiated between Russia and Ukraine by European nations. And then in April of 2022, we wanted the war. In April of 2022, President Biden sent Boris Johnson to Ukraine to force President Zelensky to tear up a peace agreement that he and the Russians had already signed and the Russians were withdrawing troops from Kiev and Donbass and Lugansk. And that peace agreement would have brought peace to the region and would have allowed Donbass and Lugansk to remain part of Ukraine. President Biden stated that month that this object, that his objective in the war was regime change in Russia. His defense secretary Lloyd Austin simultaneously explained that America's purpose in the war was to exhaust the Russian army, to degrade its capacity to fight anywhere else in the world. These objectives, of course, have nothing to do with what they were telling American about protecting Ukraine's sovereignty. Ukraine is a victim in this war, and it's a victim of, of the West. Since then, we and of, of Russia and the, both Russia and the West, since then, we have, since tearing up that agreement, forcing Zelensky to tear up the agreement, we've squandered the flower of Ukrainian youth, as many as 600,000 Ukrainian kids and over 100,000 Russian kids, none of whom, all of whom we should be mourning, have died and the Ukraine's infrastructure is destroyed. The war has been a disaster for our country as well. We squandered nearly $200 billion already, and these are badly needed dollars in our communities, suffering communities all over our country. The Nord Stream pipeline sabotage and the sanctions have destroyed Europe's industrial base, which formed the bulwark of U.S. national security. A strong Germany with a strong industry is a much, much stronger deterrent to Russia and a Germany that is, that is deindustrialized and turned into a, just an extension of U.S. military base. We've pushed Russia into a disastrous alliance with China and Iran. We're closer to the brink of nuclear exchange than at any time since 1962. And the neocons in the White House don't seem to care at all. Our moral authority and our economy are in shambles. And the war gave rise to the emergence of BRICS, which now threatens to replace the dollar as the global reserve currency. This is a first class calamity for our country. Judging by her bellicose belligerent speech last night in Chicago, we can assume that President Harris will be an enthusiastic advocate for this and other neocon military adventures. And President Trump says, that he will reopen negotiations with President Putin and end the war overnight as soon as he becomes president. This alone would justify my support for his campaign. 
last summer it looked like no candidate was willing to negotiate a quick end to the Ukraine war, to tackle chronic disease epidemic, to protect free speech, our constitutional freedoms, to clean corporate influence out of our government, or to defy the neocons and their agenda of endless military adventurism. But now one of the two candidates has adopted these issues as his own to the point where he has asked to enlist me in his administration. I'm speaking, of course, of Donald Trump. Less than two hours after President Trump narrowly escaped assassination, Callie Means called me on my cell phone. I was then in Las Vegas. Callie is arguably the leading advocate for food safety, for soil regeneration, and for ending the chronic disease epidemic that is destroying America's health and ruining our economy. Callie has exposed the insidious corruption at the FDA, the NIH, the HHS, and the USDA that has caused the epidemic. Callie had been working on and off for my campaign, advising me on those subjects since the beginning. And those subjects have been my primary focus for the last 20 years. I was delighted when Callie told me that day that he had also been advising President Trump. He told me President Trump was anxious to talk to me about chronic disease and other subjects and to explore avenues of cooperation. He asked if I would take a call from the president. President Trump telephoned me a few minutes later and I met with him the following day. A few weeks later, I met again with President Trump and his family members and close advisors in Florida. In a series of long, intense discussions, I was surprised to discover that we are aligned on many key issues. In those meetings, he suggested that we join forces as a unity party. We talked about Abraham Lincoln's team of rivals. That arrangement would allow us to disagree publicly and privately and fiercely, if need be, on issues over which we differ, while working together on the existential issues upon which we are in concordance. I was a ferocious critic of many of the policies uh, during his first administration, and, and there are still issues and approaches upon which we continue to have very serious differences. Uh, we are aligned with each other on other key issues like ending the forever wars, ending the childhood disease epidemic, securing the border, protecting freedom of speech, unraveling the corporate capture of our regulatory agencies, getting the US intelligence agencies out of the business of propagandizing and censoring and surveilling Americans and interfering with our elections. Following my first discussion with President Trump, I tried unsuccessfully to open similar discussions with Vice President Harris. Vice President Harris declined to meet or even to speak with me. Suspending my candidacy is a hard rending decision for me, but I'm convinced that it's the best hope for ending the Ukraine war and ending the chronic disease epidemic that is eroding our nation's vitality from the inside and for finally protecting free speech. I feel a moral obligation to use this opportunity to save millions of American children above all things. In case some of you don't realize how dire the condition is of our children's health and chronic disease in general, I would urge you to view Dr. Carlson's recent interview with Callie Means and his sister, Dr. Casey Means, who is the top graduate of her class at Stanford Medical School. This is an issue that affects all of us far more directly and urgently than any culture war issue and all the other issues that we obsess on and that are tearing apart our country. This is the most important issue. Therefore, it has the potential to bring us together. So let me share a little bit about why I believe it's so urgent. Today, two thirds, we, we pay, we spend more on healthcare than any country on earth, twice what they pay in Europe. And yet we have the worst health outcomes of any nation in the world. 
or about the 79th and health outcomes behind Costa Rica and Nicaragua and Mongolia and other countries. Nobody has a chronic disease burden like we have. And during the COVID epidemic, we had the highest body count of any country in the world. We had 16% of the COVID deaths and we only have 4.2% of the world's population. And CDC says that's because we are the sickest people on earth. We have the highest chronic disease rate on earth. And the average American who died from COVID had 3.8 chronic diseases. So these were people who had immune system collapse, who had mitochondrial dysfunction. And no other country has anything like this. Two thirds of American adults and children suffer from chronic health issues. 50 years ago, that number was less than 1%. So we've gone from 1% to, uh, to 66%. In America, 74% of Americans are now overweight or obese. And 50% of our children, 120 years ago, when somebody was obese, they were, uh, they were sent to the circus. They were literally, there were case reports done about them. Obesity was almost unknown. In Japan, the childhood obesity rate is 3% compared to 50% a year. Half of Americans have pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes. When my uncle was president and I was a boy, juvenile diabetes was effectively non-existent. A typical pediatrician would see one case of diabetes during his entire career, a 40 or 50 year career. Today, one out of every three kids who walks through his office door is diabetic or pre-diabetic. And the mitochondrial disorder that caused diabetes also causing uh, uh, Alzheimer's, which is now classified as diabetes. And it's costing this country more than our military budget every year. There's been an explosion of neurological illnesses that I never saw as a kid, ADD, ADHD, speech delay, language delay, Tourette syndrome, narcolepsy, ASD, Asperger's, autism. In the year 2000, the autism rate was one in 1500. Now autism rates in kids are one in 36, according to CDC nationally. Nobody's talking about this. One in every 22 kids in California has autism. And this is a crisis that 77% of our kids cannot are, are too disabled to serve in the United States military. What is happening to our country? And why isn't this in the headlines every single day? There's nobody else in the world that is experiencing this. This is only happening in America. About 18%, and by the way, you know, uh, the, the there has been no change in diagnosis, which the industry sometimes like to say, there has been no change in screening. This is a change in incidence. In my generation, 70 year old men, uh, it, the, the autism rates are about one in 10,000. In my kid's generation, one in 34. I'll repeat, in California, one in 22. Why are we letting this happen? Why are we allowing this to happen to our children? These are the most precious assets that we have in this country. How can we let this happen to them? About 18% of American teens now have fatty liver disease. That's like one out of every five. That disease, when I was a kid, only affected late stage alcoholics who were elderly. Cancer rates are skyrocketing in the young and the old. Young adult cancers are up 70, 79%. One in four American women is on antidepressant medication. 40% of teens have, a mental, teens have a mental health diagnosis. And 15% of high schoolers are on Adderall and half a million children on SSRIs. So what's causing this suffering? I'll name two culprits. First and the worst is ultra processed food. About 70% of American children's diet is ultra processed. That means industrial manufactured in a factory. These foods consist primarily of processed sugar, ultra processed grains, 
and seed oils, laboratory scientists who form, many of them formerly worked for the cigarette industry, which purchased all the big food companies in the 1970s and 80s, deployed thousands of scientists to figure out chemicals, new chemicals to make the food more addictive. And these ingredients didn't exist 100 years ago. Today, humans aren't biologically adapted to eat them. Hundreds of these chemicals are now banned in Europe, but ubiquitous in American processed foods. The second culprit is toxic chemicals in our food, in our medicine, in our environment. Pesticides, food additives, pharmaceutical drugs, and toxic waste permeate every cell of our bodies. The assault on our children's cells and hormones is unrelenting. And name just one problem. Many of these chemicals increase estrogen because young children are ingesting so many of these hormone disruptors. America's puberty rate is now occurring at age 10 to 13, which is six years earlier than girls were reaching puberty in 1900. Our country has the earliest puberty rates of any continent on the earth. And no, this isn't because of better nutrition. This is not normal. Breast cancer is also estrogen driven and it now strikes one in eight women. We are mass poisoning all of our children and our adults. Considering the grievous human cause of this tragic epidemic of chronic disease, it seems almost crass to mention the damage it does to our economy. Uh, but I'll say it is crippling the nation's finances. When my uncle was president, our country spent zero dollars on chronic disease. Today, government health care spending is mo almost all for chronic disease. And it's double the military budget. And it is the fastest budget, a growing budget item in the federal budget. And chronic disease costs more to the economy as a whole, costs at least $4 trillion, five times our military budget. And, um, and that's a 20% drag on everything we do and everything we aspire to. Poor and minority communities suffer disproportionately. People who worry about DEI or about you know bigotry of any kind, this dwarfs anything. We are poisoning the poor. We are po systematically poisoning minorities across this country. Industry lobbyists have made sure that most of the food stamp lunch program, about 70% of food stamps and 70 or 77% of school lunches are processed foods. There's no vegetables. There's nothing that you would want to eat. We are just poisoning the poor citizens, and that's why they have the highest chronic disease burden of anybody, any demographic in our country, and the highest in the world. The same food industry lobbied to make sure that nearly all agricultural subsidies go to commodity crops that are the feedstock of processed food industry. These policies are destroying small farms and they're destroying our soils. We give, uh, we give about, I think, eight times as much in subsidies to tobacco than we do to fruits and vegetables. It makes no sense. If we want a healthy country. The good news is that we can change all this. We can change it very, very quickly. America can get healthy again. To do that, we need to do three things. First, we need to root out the corruption in our health agencies. Second, we need to change incentives in our healthcare system. And third, we need to inspire Americans to get healthy again. 80% of NIH grants go to people who have conflicts of interest. These, these are the people, virtually everybody who sits, you know, Joe Biden um, just appointed a new panel to NIH to, uh, to decide the food recommendations. And they're all people who are from the industry. They're all people who are from the processed food companies. They're deciding what Americans, you know, here is healthy. And the recommendations on the food pyramid and the rec and what goes to our school lunch programs, which go what go to 
the you know the program, the uh, the, the Swiss program, the food stamp programs. They are all corrupted and conflicted individuals. These agencies, the FDA, USDA, and CDC, all of them are controlled by giant for-profit corporations. 75% of the FDA's funding doesn't come from taxpayer, it comes from pharma. And pharma executives and consultants and lobbyists cycle in and out of these agencies with President Trump's backing. I'm gonna change that. We're gonna staff these agencies with honest scientists and doctors who are free from industry funding. We're gonna make sure the decisions of consumers, doctors and patients are informed by unbiased science. A sick child is the best thing for the pharmaceutical industry. When American children or adults get sick with a chronic condition, they're put on medication for their entire life. Imagine what will happen when Medicare starts paying for Ozempic, which costs $1,500 a month, and it's being recommended for children as young as six, all for a condition, obesity, that is completely preventable and barely even existed 100 years ago. And 74% of Americans are obese. The cost, if all of them took their Ozempic prescription, is $3 trillion a year. This is a, a drug that is made by Novo Nordisk, the biggest company in Europe, it's a Danish company, and the Danish government does not recommend it. It recommends change in diet to treat obesity and exercise. And in our country, the recommendation now is for Ozempic to children at age six. Um, Novo Nord is the biggest company in Europe, and virtually its entire value is based upon its projections of what it's going to sell, of the Ozempic it's going to sell to America. And uh, and we, we have the food lobbyists have a bill in front of Congress today that is backed by the White House, backed by Vice President Harris and President Biden to, to allow this to happen. This is $3 trillion cost that is going to bankrupt our country. We, for a fraction of that amount, we could buy organic food for every American family, three meals a day, and eliminate diabetes altogether. We're, we're going to bring healthy food back to school lunches. We're going to stop subsidizing the worst foods with our agricultural subsidies. We're going to get toxic chemicals out of our food. We're going to reform the entire food system. And for that, we need new leadership in Washington. Because unfortunately, both the Democrats and the Republican parties are in cahoots with the big food producers, big pharma and big ag, which are among the DNC's major donors. Vice President Harris has expressed no interest in addressing this issue. Four more years of democratic rule will complete the consolidation of corporate and neocon power. And our children will be the ones who suffer most. I got involved with chronic disease 20 years ago, not because I chose to or wanted to. It was essentially thrust upon me. It was an issue that should have been central to the environmental movement. I was a central leader at that time but it was widely ignored by all the institutions, including the NGOs who should have been protecting our kids against toxins. It was an orphaned issue and I had a weakness for orphans. I watched generations of children get sicker and sicker. I had 11 siblings and I had seven kids myself. I was conscious of what was happening in their classrooms and to their friends. And I watched these sick kids, these damaged kids, in that generation, almost all of them are damaged. And nobody in power seemed to care or to even notice. For 19 years, I prayed every morning that God would put me in a position to end this calamity. The chronic disease crisis was one of the primary reasons for my running for president, along with ending censorship in the Ukraine war. It's the reason I've made the heart-wrenching decision to suspend my campaign and to support President Trump. This decision is agonizing for me because of the difficulties it causes my wife and my children and my friends. But I have the certainty that this is what I've meant to do. And that certainty gives me internal peace, even in storms. 
if I'm given the chance to fix the chronic disease crisis and reform our food production, I promise that within two years, we will watch chronic disease burden lift dramatically. We will make Americans healthy again. Within four years, America will be a healthy country. We will be stronger, more resilient, more optimistic and happier. I won't fail in doing this. Ultimately, the future, however it happens, is in God's hands and in the hands of the American voters and those of President Trump. If President Trump is elected and honors his word, the vast burden of chronic disease that now demoralizes and bankrupts the country will disappear. This is a spiritual journey for me. I reached my decision through deep prayer, through hard-nosed logic, and I asked myself, what choices must I make to maximize my chances to save America's children and restore national health? I felt that if I refused this opportunity, I would not be able to look myself in the mirror, knowing that I could have saved lives of countless children and reversed this country's chronic disease epidemic. I'm 70 years old. I may have a decade to be effective. I can't imagine that President Harris, a President Harris, would allow me or anyone to solve these, these dire problems. After eight years of President Harris, any opportunity for me to fix the problem will be out of my reach forever. President Trump has told me that he wants this to be his legacy. I'm choosing to believe that this time he will follow through. His son, his biggest donors, his closest friends, and all support this objective. My joining the Trump campaign will be a difficult sacrifice for my wife and children, but worthwhile if there's even a small chance of, of saving these kids. Ultimately, the only thing that will save our country and our children is if we choose to love our kids more than we hate each other. That's why I launched my campaign to unify America. My dad and uncle made such an enduring mark on the character of our nation not so much because of any particular policies that they promoted, but because they were able to inspire profound love for our country and to fortify our sense of ourselves as a national community held together by ideals. They were able to put their love into the intentions and hearts of ordinary Americans and to unify a national populist movement of Americans, Blacks and whites, Hispanics, urban and rural Americans, inspired affection and love and high hopes and a culture of kindness that continue to ra radiate among Americans in, from their memory. That's the spirit on which I ran my campaign and that I intend to bring into the campaign of President Trump. Instead of vitriol and polarization, I will appeal to the values that unite us the goals that we could achieve if only we weren't at each other's throats. The most unifying theme for all Americans is that we all love our children. If we all unite around that issue now, we can finally give them the protection, the health, and the future that they deserve. Thank you all very much. It's the greatest, it's the greatest speech I've ever heard. I'm just hitting, I'm hitting send on a tweet because that was holy shiat people. Let me bring this out. I like to keep it up for a few minutes. The, the part that he said about the, the, the not strife, but the, the conflict or the discord with his wife. I think we just witnessed something that um, is a once in a political lifetime uh, event. I uh, just had to tweet out the, one of the highlights. Let me just make sure it got sent where he said, 
Vice President Harris has expressed no interest in addressing the issue. Four more years of democratic rule will complete the consolidation of corporate and neocon power and our children. Oh, crap. I got to do that. And our children. Damn it. And our children. And our children will be the ones who suffer the most. That was the great. I mean, look, um, and it's 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 not it's not a question of liking someone only because they've come to your side or they agree with you. I've I've liked RFK for a while, despite him not <laughs> potentially taking votes from Trump. You understand what he, you understand what he, what he's done here. I mean, everybody has to understand this. We are an above average community at Viva Barnes. I presume the same is true of Rumble. He's pulling himself out of the battleground states. Quite clearly, anybody and everybody who was ever going to vote for RFK in a battleground state now only has two choices, Satan and Trump. He's not pulling out of Trump red states. Obviously, now no, no, nobody's, no one who remotely wants Trump. In fact, every, every Kennedy supporter in a red state is going to vote for Trump now. L logically, unless, you know, they're diehards who say, I don't care what Kennedy wants. I'm going to go vote for Kennedy anyhow in a, in a, red, in a uh, red state. In a blue state, by not taking his name off, there might be a substantial amount of Democrats, especially in frickin' California, who might vote for Kennedy. And I don't know how it could happen logistically or number-wise. You could have some blue states go to Kennedy and take those electoral college votes from the Democrats to an independent. He was crying. I'm, I'm going to not cry myself because my... Uh, Testosterone levels are far too high for um, for me to cry. I'm joking. This is the it's, first of all that speech. That speech from a substantive level is probably the greatest speech I've ever heard. Not probably. It's the greatest political speech I've ever heard in my life, live. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to compare it to other ones. On a substantive level, he 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 didn't hit everything in a cheap, tawdry. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? superficial type of way he hit everything war big i mean he 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 dropped stats that i don't think many people know about you know the the fatty liver the only, I, there's all there's a I, you know fatty livers in children my wife and i have been talking about this uh about diets at school and the shit that they serve by way of food i'm sorry to swear It's the greatest thing I've ever, I mean, I, I, I don't want to overblow it. It's the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. And, and like, let me just bring up King of Biltong because he makes good food. Biltong, $15 on Rumble Rant. Biltong is one of the most protein-dense foods in the world. Biltong is also full of B12, zinc, iron, creatine, looking for a healthy snack, food. Go to Biltong USA Viva 10 for 10% off. Order it, by the way, guys. It's just, it's just delicious like a prosciutto but made out of beef it's amazing i got i got a bag in the uh, it's in the fridge i like to leave it out and get a little soft before i eat it but i'll, I'll do that in a second i mean it, it, for, politically speaking i would love to be a fly on the wall i would have i would love to be a fly on the wall that that itch bay hold on i can't see the chat's moving a little bit too fast okay stop it here this is what i want to bring up there, Pip. Tabarouette. Can I do it? Wow. It was a wow moment, and I hope this speech gets played over and over again. It didn't get taken down from YouTube yet. I I'm wondering if they're going to take it down from YouTube so that people can't see it because of medical disinformation, because there are a bunch of commie scumbags at YouTube. That wasn't the chat that I wanted to bring up. It's very difficult to admit out loud that your country is trying to kill you. Strategically, you know, he'll get to, it's, it's, I mean, not pulling out, it's, it's, it's actually an amazing thing. If he pulled out of all, it's, <laughs> I'm talking out loud and I don't want to get RFK Jr. in trouble. Not pulling out of all states is a bigger middle finger to the Democrats than pulling out and suspending his race in general. I hope everybody appreciates that. If he suspends his campaign entirely and pulls out of the blue states, 
you no longer run the risk of a blue state going to an, a candidate independently. <clears throat> By suspending in battleground states, he does as much as humanly possible to increase the odds of Trump winning the battleground states. By staying in in red states, he does absolutely nothing to hurt Trump because he's basically told his base, vote for Trump. That is the biggest middle finger to a system that has spent its life trying, it, it, sorry, that has spent its existence trying to destroy RFK Jr.'s life. Try, trying to kill him literally by denying Secret Service under the Biden-Harris regime. And I, I tweeted out, pride goeth before the fall. I reached out to Kamala Harris. Itch Bay wouldn't take my phone calls because we're the enemy. We don't, we don't talk with people. Shut up, RFK. I'm speaking now. She, you adopted that attitude with the wrong person, Kamala, and now it's come back to bite you in the ass. Obese underscore Norwell has subscribed. Welcome to the community, obese Norwell. Hopefully, if you're trying to cure that obesity, a Trump Vance with RFK in the campaign administration will help you. Ozambique, that drug. Just, hey, give him drugs. I'll share a little. I'll share, I'll share a little. I'll, I'll be vague, but I'm going to be ambiguous about it because I don't want to tell people stories that are not mine to tell. This one's sort of mine, but sort of involves, you know, a family member. To, tr to treat misbehaving young boys at schools, uh, schools... Sometimes, in my lived experience, have demanded of the parents that you medicate your child. Otherwise, normal, beautiful children, medicate them. Mentally medicate them because teachers are too lazy to deal with rambunctious young boys. No, obese children? Don't tell them to get their asses on a bike and go biking or go fishing and get some fresh air. No, give them drugs. Over-medicate with, with, with SSRIs. Over-medicate with obesity drugs instead of curing the problem through healthy living. Mother, mother, Kirby, I'm getting my kid on a bike and we're going biking right now. We're going to go. I, I, didn't, I didn't get enough exercise today anyhow. It's a sick, corrupt mentality. Four more years of a Harris, of a, de what was it? Four more years of a democratic rule, of democratic rule will complete the consolidation of corporate and neocon power and our children will be the ones who suffer most. Do you imagine the decision that he had to make? especially if there is actual discord among him and his wife over endorsing Trump. I, I, uh, it was ambiguous. He wouldn't specify it. He didn't specify it, nor should he, even if it's the case. You don't air your disagreements with your spouse. It's you versus the world, and you don't let the world get in between you and your spouse. I will, I will just take it to mean she didn't want him to drop out of the race because she rightly feels that he promised things to the people, his supporters, and it might be a, something of a betrayal to his supporters. I'm going to see what Kyle Kemper has to feel about this. I don't, I don't think this was a TDS of a wife because I don't think you can be married to a person who has TDS and you go out and support Trump. I don't think it was that. I think it was more of a principled, your, your supporters are going to feel betrayed and don't do it type thing. Hold on. I think it was more that thanks for reading my wow statement. Even if it wasn't the one you were looking for, it was fate is what it was. Love the Viva platform. Thank you, says Deb Wish. There's a lot. There's a, can you imagine just a minute? It's hard not to think this, 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 by this, this results from the act of God that we saw on July 13. All of this. The entire path of the universe results from that divine intervention to turn ahead, stave off what would have been the descent into World War III, unify what will become the ultimate unity ticket of 2024, and, and arguably repair a very, very broken system in what is the greatest country on earth. Can you imagine... That's that is the new that's the new course of reality that has been initiated as a result of that moment of divine intervention. And there are still people out there who don't understand that we witnessed a bona fide miracle. Hold on. 
Leave it. The best gift you could give your son is a broken lawnmower. Let him figure out how to fix it. Then he has a way of making money, mowing lawns with the neighbors and running a business. He'll also get exercise that way. Esran, maybe maybe not in uh, Florida because the, the landscaping here is is a. I don't think you want to encroach on the landscaping industry because, yeah. I one I for one have hope for the U.S. You want to, you want to talk about joy and hope? This is what it looks like: healing children, not fucking lying to people for forty minutes straight. So today is when Viva finds God. But it might have been it might have been July thirteen, but we might just have to agree on our terms. What does God mean? I'm going to bring these up as much as I can. Here, hold on. Bye bye, pharma. I, I I I don't want to put juju bad juju out in the universe. What 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 Kennedy has done today outlives Kennedy, as in. Um, they always make the I'm not suicidal joke. What what Kennedy has done goes beyond Kennedy's life. May he live another 20 years and a good 20 years, but it goes beyond his life. There's no longer the what if the deep state tries to take out Kennedy now. What he's done would survive that and even be amplified by that. I'll stop acting like a sissy with the words. If they try to kill RFK Jr. now, it would only be reprisal, and the message that RFK just put out today would only be amplified by that evil. What he's done right now is now um, unassassinable. All good guys says David. We bugged Lara Trump enough that she's made a public call for new lawyers for the for this election. <laughs> And then we got Trump's next target, big landscaping, says Pasha Moyer in our community. So, I mean, it's it's the most glorious, it's it's just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Uh, but I, I wasn't alive for, I mean, I, first of all, I wasn't alive for certain things and I wasn't politically conscious for other things. Demon crap keep their power by putting political opposition on terrorist watch lists. That's Crash Bandit who's talking about um, what they did to, uh, sorry, um, what they did to Tulsi Gabbard. Obama revoked the Smith-Mund Modernization Act in 2013, allowing for the legal dissemination of propaganda upon Americans. The elite bought most news, lied to Americans 12 years to almost subvert the USA. I remember back in the early days of the channel, everyone's like, Viva, cover the smith Moon, the smith Moon Act. I remember it. Maybe we're going we're gonna to talk about it on Sunday. Let me, let me screen grab that. I hope, uh, wow. It's going to bring up all of these here. I just wanted Teretz and I got dyslexia. What the fudge? I just wanted Teats? Crash Bandit. Uh, okay, let me bring this one up here. The I doubt the swamp trademark is going to relinquish power. Trump won the 2024 presidency the moment he dodged a bullet. Tyrants will not step aside. They've already said so. They fear Nuremberg trials. Snuggle struggle. This is the other thing. What they've set in motion now survives any one of the people of this administration. This, this now, in, in a way, it's beyond, I mean, not in a way, in, in, in a meaningful way, it's beyond Trump. You got Vance. In a, now, in a way, it's beyond Vance. You got RFK. You got Tulsi Gabbard. You've got the hearts, souls, minds, and dedication, not dedication, sorry, what's what I'm looking for? Devotion. Of anybody and everybody with half a brain, with a child who has been afflicted by any one of these illnesses, ailments, it's not just limited to the jibby jab, and that's a big one. Diabetes, autism. Can you imagine the statistics on autism? And I'm trying to steel man this to myself in my head here, saying, "Well, they've gotten better at diagnosing it." In my in my lifetime, I, I've got family family members and best friends who have children with autism. Thought, you know, and 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 blessed in the sense that I, I can I multiple it's and it's not normal. And then the only question is, what's the cause? And people want to can you imagine the, the the level of demonizing that they have done for for RFK on the on the jibby jab? it's it's not it's not normal. I grow I'm only forty five years old. I mean, first of all, we come from a healthy 
I, there were, there were a couple of obese kids in school and I'm sure they live with, you know, they, they live with um, that because there weren't that many back when I was a kid. Of course we did. We went biking all day on the weekend and we, we, I don't know what the food was like, but different than today. I never knew anybody with autism growing up and not because they weren't diagnosed. I mean, I, I know the people that I know with autism now, some are more functional than others, but it's not something you, it's not something you don't notice. The only question is why? Crash Bandit, Viva, have you seen any of Ken Barry MD stuff on YouTube or Rumble? He would be a good person to talk about the chronic disease. I started a carnivore diet after my doctor wanted me to put on statins, and I'm 25, I guess I meant pounds, and I am down 25 pounds. Oh, that is pounds. Okay, that's a pound. In two months. I haven't. I screen grabbed it. Um, I've always eaten a lot of meat, but that's just because... He is making a landmark, sincere, genuine speech. You know, it's very, very. I don't know that there are any notes to that speech. Love, admire, and respect him more than ever. He swiped a tear away. Okay, I think I got everything. Let me make sure that I got everything. We're at the Shailene. That was a great speech. Hold on. Bill Tong, he's making a landmark. Okay, so I got that. That was the greatest speech I've ever seen as well, says Gumby. RFK Jr. destroyed and torpedoed the Democrats so that we don't have to go to war to end the endless wars, says Slim Shagan. Obese Norwell, I got you. He also gave an analysis of, he also gave a great analysis of the Ukraine proxy war. Remember when it was verboten to suggest that the West might have forced Russia into this by wanting, they're using Finland to store fire, to firearms, to store weapons of war, weapons of war, not, not AR-15s like they try to mislabel that. Bombs. What did they say here? Let me let me just make sure that I can pull this up. I want to remember. I forget the word that they a stockpile. Finland, NATO stockpile weapons. NATO's military presence. How Finland approaches its new NATO role is key. I forget what the what the someone can find the the. the with more NATO allies, will the U.S. store arms in Europe? I guess we have to do arms, not weapons. Stockpile. How Finland? Oh, geez, I forget. There was a, there was an article I pulled it up a while back, and it have, talks about how they're basically using Finland to stockpile weapons. Right? NATO member. Uh, war with Ukraine. Rustang says. Viva suggestion, if and when you have a school meeting regarding your child, make sure you are introduced to all administrators present. If a school board lawyer is present, walk out. They may be lining you up to penalize you for one or more of the multitude of school board policies they have in a big binder to legally go after parents. I'll just go ahead and screen grab that. I'm not so nervous about that anyhow. And I think we got all of it. Bye-bye, Big Pharma. Trump's lawyer. Okay, we got it. We got everything. All right, let me take those out. Let me just go to the the, the chat to see what's going on in Viva Barnes Law .locals.com. I mean, is this S. Sarles says back in 2006 there was sufficient evidence in summary, mostly from Journal of Applied Nutrition, that showed chelation therapy worked. Therefore, the problem was toxicity. Same year, the AMA's pockets, the American Medical Association's pocket info for doctors said we do not know. Wakefield, good research was lawfared out of practice. We have known from then but it was strongly covered up. They really, they, they, they pushed their hand with the COVID stuff. They pushed it way, way too far. Um, I feel a renewed sense of inspiration. Do I, do I really cross the line? And I, I was gonna say, do I now go and have a Red Bull? I'm not gonna have a Red Bull. I might have another, another one of these bad boys, 70 calories, cane sugar, cold brewed coffee, a little bit of, what does it say here? I can't see cream, delicious, organic cane sugar, and not that much of it. Maybe I'll have another one of those, but I'm certainly going to take my kid and go do something good right now. Um, well, let me just go refresh the markets and see what the markets are doing. Yeah, the markets are up 10%, over 10%, 15% differential, just based on my portfolio since that speech. We're, we're, we're living through history, period. I've got a pee again with my OAB, overactive bladder. They say that caffeine, alcohol, 
uh, what are the else they say that are bad for overactive bladders? I do, I do. There's a number of them. I know where my, I know where my dietary vices are. Uh, but I'm doing a live stream with Elijah Schaefer at seven o'clock, so I got to get there by six, and it's about thirty minutes away. So five thirty, it's four o'clock. Now I want to do something with my kids, so I'm going to go do something with my kids. I'm going to go biking, and I'm going to see a freaking, I'm going to see a freaking boa constrictor eating a deer. That's all I want to see. Like, okay, I will. That orange dog. I will have. Li I will be the Florida man. I'm not going to interfere with it because nature is beautiful. I want to see a boa constrictor eating not a deer. That's too big. That's that's less likely. There's a, there's two things. I want to happen. It'll happen one day where when I'm biking, uh, the iguanas that sunbathe when they jump into the water, they're going to get eaten by an alligator. I just need to have my GoPro running when that happens. I want to see a boa constrictor, uh, not a boa constrictor, the uh, Burmese python, which apparently they're all over the place, but I haven't seen them yet. So I want to see a Burmese python eating a large mammal. That's not me, a, a, an animal. And I'm going to go get some exercise or at least just at the very least go fishing. Um, before everybody goes, if you're on watching on Rumble, make sure that you're subscribed. Hit the uh, thumbs up button, the Rumble notification. I need to get Robert F. Kennedy on for a, a, a podcast. I need to. I just, I don't like begging and I don't like... Um, um, bro breaching like certain oh now the dog hold on one second jeez louise stop that god dog's gonna scratch a hole through the door uh i'm gonna try to uh figure out something to get an interview with rfk jr at the rumble studio in longboat keys so anyone out there wants to tweet it out and make it you know get get that ball rolling i would love to see that happen Viva, find some good recipes for snake Polish dog. I've eaten snake before. Uh, I, it was like deep fried snake up at the Grand Canyon. Tasted like chicken. Of course, you deep fry anything. Uh, that'd be great with RFK, says um, kids today. I, I mean, it would be amazing. Vance is proof of the American dream. Can you imagine? It, the, uh, we'll leave it on this. It, it's The emperor is naked. It, evil has been revealed. They had a week, and they spewed bullshit, lies, lies and more lies all they do is lie all they do is deflect all they do is project and that is not projection people so don't accuse me of lying and deflection and projection because i'm accusing them of lying deflection and projection i have the i have the evidence i have the receipts i specifically reference it nationwide abortion ban lie find people hoax lie what was the other one bloodbath if he doesn't get elected lie and they say them they say them like it's like it's like water spilling over a waterfall they're going to fix the economy that they broke. They're going to beat big pharma that they claim to have just beaten. They're going to solve the housing crisis, which results from demand that they've broken it. And that scoundrel of a Kamala Harris gets up there. They rebrand her with their propaganda wing of the Democrat party. They rebrand her as the savior. And people don't understand it. It drives me freaking nuts. Oh, but Trump is worse. He's not worse. He's never been worse. If you say that, you have been brainwashed. Understand it. Trump was never worse. He has never been worse. He has always been loved, beloved, and a good person. He got the Ellis Island Award in the 80s. Oprah Winfrey loved him in the early 2000s. It's a shame you're not running for office. We'd make a great team. If you think that Trump would be worse or you think you hate Trump, you have been brainwashed and just grow and evolve out of it. We've all been duped. It's the stubborn doubling down on having been duped that goes from being duped to being evil. And not evil in any serious consequence way, in the sense that it's never too late to wake up. I feel better. Holy cows. I feel I feel optimistic and I feel good. I hope everyone does too. Uh, locals, there will be no locals after party today. Maybe what I'll do is um get a little video from the from the Everglades as we go for a bike ride and see what's out there. It looks sunny, but it looks like it might be a little overcast based on the window. Pudge is looking here. You want, you want to see that? Uh, I can't. I got some documents out that have names on them. Um, go. Enjoy the day. Get, and I say this at the end of each video, and it's sort of like it becomes like the, the, the repetitive ending that people stop listening to. Get outside. Get sunlight exercise the, the the most amazing transformation that i can fully appreciate 
though I've never lived through it, is watching someone try to get into shape. And it's such a long journey with incremental uh, advances that it's almost discouraging. But when people do it, and then they see those incremental advances day after day, after a month, you start to see them. After two months, everybody starts to see them. Get out there and exercise. Eat healthy. Sunlight and talk to people. Socialize. In as much as I call people, you know, call people who I think are idiots names, uh, I am always open for the discussion. Discuss with people. But my goodness, get out there and spread this word like it's a, a forest fire of optimism, if we can say it like that. And now that she scratched at the door to get in, now she's wanting to get out. Here, oh, hold on a second, hold on a second. Let me just, let me just show, I want to show the world what I have, what I'm dealing with here. Yeah, you're, you're on. I'm recording you now. Yeah, what are you saying? Oh, oh, she's coming. She's coming. She's coming. I don't want any trouble. Here, just check this out. This is what I live with. Four o'clock in the morning, every morning. Okay, we got we got a chorus of dogs. Holy cows, people! Welcome to history. We're living through it. Go and enjoy the day. Thank you for being here. Uh, six o'clock, seven o'clock tonight. Elijah Schaefer and uh, Sunday night show going to be obviously the biggest of bangers. It's going to be the uh, 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 banger banger. Uh, what else? Monday. Holy cows! I almost forgot to say this. Uh, Austin Peterson's coming on. Here, hold on a second. Let me just make sure I can. Uh, let me just make sure I can publicly announce that. Let's go to my messages. Uh, da, 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 just going over here. Yep. Yeah, let me see. Can I control? Yeah. Austin Peterson is coming on Monday, 1230. Going to be amazing. So it's just, it's, it's all, it feels good. Do not let up. There's no slam dunk. There's no money in the bag here. There's no counting your chickens before they hatched. Bongino, go get your 10 friends and make sure they get 10 friends. Do it. But right now there's still time left in the day on the East coast. You have more than enough time on the West coast in the evening in the UK. Enjoy it. Get out there. Exercise. You want to say hi? Yeah. Oh, I know that she's just pooped, so that's not going to happen. And I know that I squeezed her out and she's peeping. Mm, mm. Oh, look at this fat little pig. Oh, yeah. This is Pudge, paralyzed puggle. She's 14 years old now. We've had her since 2016. Yeah. Oh, man, I was just had my hand on her genitalia. Okay, go. Enjoy. It was with this hand, by the way, not with this one. That's why I scratched here and I'm just waiting to go boil this one. Uh, enjoy the day, people. I'll put out a vlog if I can, but 7 o'clock live, Sunday night show, Monday, 12.30, Austin Peterson, and that is it. Optimism, people, this is what joy looks like, not what Al Sharpton was shrieking about like a demonic, possessed, oh, scoundrel that he is. Go. Peace be with you.